as he did on the inner relationship. And that if, if this is right, other things will fall into place. Uh, look, the, the way to get your relationship with God where it needs to be, don't start with, okay, I'm going to stop doing this and I'm going to start doing this. No, you start actively building a relationship with Him. How do you build a relationship with anybody? Well, you've got to spend time with them, right? You can't build a relationship with someone if you don't spend time with them. And so before you, you worry about all this external stuff, man, dig into his word. Let him speak to you through his word. Find some private time to spend with him getting to know him. Sir, when you first started dating that young lady that you're married to, you didn't just start out by saying, uh, well, I'm going to do all this stuff. No, to build that relationship, you started getting to know her and, and trying to keep her from finding out about all your mess, right? No, you tried to start getting to know her, letting her get to know you. You sat down and talked with each other. You would look into each other's eyes. You would share things with each other, share your heart, share your dreams, share your ambitions, share your visions, and and uh, uh, share your heartaches. The more you got to know each other, the closer you became. Well, one of the biggest things I've taken away from this is I just want to know him more. You know, by, by knowing my wife better, I just naturally know the things she likes and dislikes. All right? I know that she cannot stand for people to get her attention by snapping or by whistling or by saying, hey, woman, Okay. Uh, she told me when we first started, uh, got married, she said, look, three things. Please never snap, whistle, or say, hey, woman. And so, of course, I had to do it. And I said, hey, woman. And uh, that didn't go over good. But that's how her dad always did. She said, please don't do that. But since then, I've learned other things she likes and dislikes. How do I learn those things? Just because I got to know her. And now I do those things because of my love for her. That's how we're supposed to get close to God. We saw a few weeks ago now his crucifixion, Jesus Christ hanging on the cross. We saw that on Christmas Day. We actually talked about that because that's the whole reason that he came. Am I right? The whole reason he was born was he had to get to that cross, hang on that cross. The Bible says he became sin for us. The Bible says he bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might be made the righteousness of God and Him. He took our place so that we could be clothed in His righteousness. And boy, on that cross, he, he suffered for us so that we would not have to. All we have to do is place our faith in Jesus Christ. At this point now, He's been resurrected. He's no longer dead. We saw last week those men on the road to Emmaus and how they're walking and they're talking about things. They're engrossed in this conversation about what all had been going on and, and uh, uh, Jesus the resurrected Christ comes alongside them and begins to walk with them and inserts himself into the conversation but they're so overwhelmed they're so distraught they're so downcast because they had, it was they said to him look do you not know what's going on even a stranger would know what's going on this Jesus he's a man mighty in word and in deed and we thought for sure he was the Messiah, but he died. They're so overwhelmed, they don't even recognize him until what? what? What were they doing when they recognized him? They were breaking bread. See, that's why we eat around here so much. There's Bible precedence for that, right? We are growing in the Lord. He sits down with them. In the breaking of bread, in that Eastern culture, that's an intimate time that you spend. Sometimes a meal can last for hours talking, getting to know each other. And boy, I tell you, if you want to see Christ in your life, then you've got to take some time away to sit down with him. Now we come to this point here. This last passage, Jesus has one last thing to tell his disciples we see in verse number 36 that he appears to them. And as they 
Thus spake Jesus himself, himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. <clears throat> Those two disciples that had met him on the road to Emmaus, they have now, remember, when they realized who it was, they got up, they hightailed it back to Jerusalem. Now, as they're telling the other disciples, hey, we saw him, we walked with him, he, he shared the scriptures with us and taught us from uh, Moses and all the prophets. And remember what he was trying to do there? <clears throat> he was teaching them to put their confidence in the scriptures, not in his physical presence because it wasn't always going to be there, but in the scriptures. And now as they're telling these other disciples these things, Jesus appears in the midst of them. And notice they were, their reaction. They were, they were afraid. They thought he was a spirit. Now, look, don't be too hard on these guys. They're in a room where doors and windows are, are sealed, and they're eating a meal, and all of a sudden, this, this image walks through a wall or materializes, and there's Jesus. Naturally, they thought, man, this is, this is a spirit here. In verse 37 through 39, he comforts them. He, knows their, he knew their thoughts. He knew, hey, they're afraid. They don't think I'm the real deal. In verse 39, he even encourages them to handle him. Look at verse number 39. <clears throat> Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. In John 1, 1, we see, 1 John 1, 1, we see John, the apostle, possibly referring to this instance here where it says, that which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. He said, look, our hands handled him after the resurrection. And I think it's very interesting that even in his glorified body, he could say, look, here's my hands and my feet. Those nail prints were still there. In verse 40, he eats with them. And he's proving to them, it was further proof that he was not a spirit. A, a spirit does not, uh, is not able to eat and, and be handled like that. And he's proving to them, listen, I know you saw me die. I'm resurrected. I'm the real deal. I'm not just a spirit. Then in verse 44, I want you to look. He not only comforts them, but he teaches them the scriptures. In verse number 44, the word of God says this. Then he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. He goes back and he reminds them of the Old Testament prophecy. Maybe he took them over to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, where it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Surely he took him over to Isaiah 53 where it talked about by his stripes ye were healed. Surely he took him to the Psalms. It says there that he went even to the Psalms, Psalms 22, chapter, uh, chapter 22, chapter 23, chapter 24, which are prophetic Psalms of the Savior. In Luke 18, 31, the Bible says, Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. <clears throat> so before he had told them, look, we're going to Jerusalem. Here's all that the Old Testament said was going to happen to me. And then it happened, and so now afterwards, they're still, they had not got it. They're, they're in disbelief. They're in, in awe and wonder. They're disappointed. They're, they're downcast. But now he appears to him. He said, look, I told you already, these things that the Scripture said, they had to be fulfilled, and they, they were fulfilled, and now I've been risen again. <clears throat> By the way, we're still pointed to his word to affirm that his promises are true. Let, let me say, folks, I, and I cannot say enough, measure your faith by the word, not what man says. And don't believe something just because a preacher says it. You... you you measure it by the word of God. This week I've heard of a couple of preachers. One preacher uh, uh, from a very uh, influential church in America. As far as I know, he's a, he's a good preacher. Uh, I've read some things by him that were solid. I've heard some of his sermons that were very solid. But uh, recently he said that the virgin birth is not a, a crucial point in our faith. 
the, the resurrection is the crucial point. But look, without the virgin birth, there wouldn't have been a resurrection. You, you can't start chipping away at, at truths of the Word of God. Uh, John Hagee uh, recently said, I saw a portion of a, one of his sermons where he said that the, the Jews uh, should not be, uh, did not actually reject Christ as the Messiah because he did not come as the Messiah. That's not what the scriptures say. Now, I, I, I've not heard him in, in a long time. I don't have time really to listen to much TV preachers. I, I, I'm very selective with my preachers. And I'm not saying he's a bad preacher, but I will say this. He's wrong. Christ did come as the Messiah. And the word Christ, and I wish I'd wrote the scripture down, the word Christ and Messiah are synonymous. That one is the, So look, live your life by the scriptures, folks. And I want to encourage you, don't believe everything I say just because I say it. I'm just a man. I can get it wrong once in a while. Measure it by the word of God. In verse 45, it says, He opened their understanding. In other words, it finally clicked with them. It finally came together. How many of you, when you were in school, you always had a subject that just, it just came slow to you. Anybody like that? <clears throat> Look, how many of you ever in, in school diagrammed sentences in English grammar? Okay, man alive. I went to public school the first part of my, my uh, I about said my career. I wasn't in school that long, but first part of school. I, I started going to a, a Christian school in the middle of my seventh grade year. In public school, I, I never even heard of diagramming sentences. And so I started going to the Christian school about the middle of my seventh grade year. And I don't know, Miss Tammy, do they diagram sentences in public school? Not very much, okay. So we started diagramming sentences. Man, I, I had never heard of that. And I was okay with, okay, you, you draw this line like a cross and you put the subject here and the verse, verb here. I was okay with that. I was okay with the eight parts of speech. But then they started throwing in direct objects and indirect objects, and infinitives, and, and, and prepositional phrases, and, and all these things, gerunds, infinitives, participles, and having to put all those things, and then throwing in the adverbs, and the adjectives, and, and the implied subjects, and, and all this, and then compound sentences, diagramming them bad boys, and then the complex sentences, and then, just because I guess some Nazis dreamed this up in World War II, com compound complex sentences, having to diagram those things. And I came from being in, uh, in advanced classes in public school to where now just in the, the regular English class in seventh grade, I was getting a solid F. And man, I just couldn't get it. And the teacher would say, it's okay, you'll get it. And I want to tell you when I got it. When I was about 29 or 30 years old, and we started a school at our church, and I don't know, maybe I was a little older than that, uh, but we started a school at the church, and we didn't have an English teacher. So guess who got to do all the jobs that nobody else did? This guy. So guess who did a crash course study in diagram and sentences? And by that time, I had some maturity and I had a little bit more sense, about a little more sense. And all of a sudden, it clicked. And I thought, oh, well, that's easy. That's not a problem at all. It only took me to about sometime between 29 and 32 years old to finally learn what they were teaching in seventh grade. I was slow of understanding these disciples for three years they had followed Christ he had told them the whole time this is coming folks after it happened they they missed the whole thing and he comes back and he says look <clears throat> let me show you again what I've been showing you in the scriptures this was prophesied this is what happened once again he was bringing them back to the scriptures that's another thing I've taken away from this study we've done how much Christ just kept taking them to the scriptures, taking them to the scriptures. Look, it is good to be well read, but don't be well read to the exclusion of reading 
the Bible. This is the key, the key critical book right here. It was, how was that going to change their lives going forward, though? Since they knew that he had died and risen again, it finally clicked. How is that going to change their lives going forward? Well, let me ask you, how are the scriptures and how are the scriptures changing your life going forward? They're supposed to be constantly doing that, right? We don't just read them and say, oh, okay, th yeah, that's nice, and sit down and not let it affect us. It ought to change us. How is this going to change these men? Since they knew that he had died and risen again, here's what they were going to do. They were going to preach and teach that truth. Mark 16, 15. Listen to one, one of Jesus' last words he says to them before he ascends. And he said to them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Do you see the big critical thing that after Jesus died, he rose again, it finally clicked. He's getting ready to leave now. He's getting ready to ascend to heaven. He will not be with them in bodily form anymore. He'll send the Holy Spirit to comfort them. But as he's getting ready to leave, he says, Fellas, now here's what I want you to do. I'm the Messiah. I'm the Christ. I'm the risen Savior. I'm getting ready to leave. Now you've learned the truth. Go, you go and tell the world. Let me say that command is for every one of us, folks. If we truly know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died for our sins to pave our way to heaven and he rose again and all we've got to do is trust Christ as Savior, place our faith in him, then how does that change us? Oh, well, it may, uh, you know, I got me a good haircut. No, no, no. We're to go and tell others. But let me tell you something. The answer for all of Mount Olive's woes is not getting a better haircut. Okay? And it's not wearing a, ch a tie to church. That's not the answer to Mount Olive's woes. It, it's not... Better education, although better education is a good thing. Here's the answer to all of Mount Olive's woes. Jesus Christ. And everything else will come from that. But you've got to start with the foundation. And Jesus Christ is the foundation. Now whose job is it to share that, that truth? Well, preacher, that's your job. Yes, it is. Who else's job? Ours. Everywhere we go. If you read the New Testament, yes, they daily went to the house, went house to house and to the temple and did all that. But if you really read it and look at the overall picture, I want to tell you who they shared the gospel with. Everybody they came into contact with. He said, I want you to go and tell the world. Tell them those things that have finally clicked with you. I'm the risen Savior. I am alive. I'm the only way to heaven. Let me ask you to examine yourself for a minute. How are you doing with that injunction? Do we let the, the, the truth of the risen Savior change us so that going forward is just part of who we don't even have to force it. It's just part of who we are that we tell others about Christ. There are things in here that men love to do. Brad, what, what's something you love to do? Hunt. How many of you in here have ever talked to Brad? Anybody ever in here? Okay. How many of you have ever, in talking to Brad, heard Brad talk about hunting? You know why? Because Brad loves to hunt. How many of you have ever heard Brad talk about Jesus? Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass him. Oh, Ethan, it, his son raised his hand. Good, that you owe him ten dollars. <clears throat> if I truly love Christ, if I'm truly following him, and I'm going to tell the message that he told, 
and it shouldn't have to be forced, to preach the message of repentance and remission of sins. Repentance to change direction or to change the mind. Just the day, days before the people had rejected Christ as Savior, now the, the apostles are going to be preaching, no, 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 change that direction, change that mind. You need to accept Him as your Savior. That remission of sin, or uh, Acts 20, 20 through 21, and the Bible says, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. When we turn to Christ, then our sins are forgiven. Listen to Romans 8, 25. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. When I place my faith in Jesus Christ, all of my sins are forgiven. They're washed away. Acts 1.8. Listen to this. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be what? Yeah. I used to think that was a command. But I don't know that it, anymore was it a command or was it just, he was just stating the fact. This is going to happen and just naturally, you're going to be my witnesses. You're going to go out and tell people. 1 Timothy 2, 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. He then tells them in verse 49 about the Holy Spirit. He tells them, now look, you're going to go and preach, fellas, but before you go and preach, I want you to wait in Jerusalem. Look in verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, that was the Holy Spirit, but tarry ye in Jerusalem, or in the city of Jerusalem, until ye be endued with power from on high. He told them to wait. Before they were to preach, they were to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. He had already told them that the Holy Spirit was on the way. Now listen, the Holy Spirit of God came primarily to give power and comfort to believers so that they might preach Christ to the world. The primary function of the Holy Spirit was not the giving of gifts just for the sake of giving of gifts. Boy, some will point to all the gifts and nothing wrong with the gifts, but they point as if that's the end, but that's not the end. Those were a means to the end. <clears throat> Listen to this, John 15, 26. But when the comforter, comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he, the Holy Spirit, shall testify of me. Let me, let, me, let me tell you one way to tell if, if people who uh, are claiming to be exercising gifts are exercising gifts or not. Are they testifying of Christ or are they testifying of their own power? Look, when, when Benny Hinn stands in front of people and says, fire on you, and they pass out, and then he looks at everybody, I saw a video of him doing that, I watched one of his services uh, just because I'd never seen one, I thought it was interesting. And he, he looks at the people on the platform and says, fire on you, and they all fall out. And then he looks in the balcony and says, fire on you, and a bunch of people fall down, but then a few are still standing up, and then they look around and oh, I'm supposed to be falling down. Uh, really, I saw that. My wife saw one. He, 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 he blew in some lady's face, and she passed out, and the men caught her and laid her down, and when they stood up, her wig had wrapped around one of them's button and pulled her wig off of, and, and her wig was hung on his jacket, and she reaches up and gets it, puts it on her head, and and goes back to sleep. Now, listen, here's the thing, and I don't, I don't know Benny Hinn. I've never met him. I don't know. Maybe he, he's a great guy. I, I don't know. But here's the thing. In all of that, he was never testifying of Christ. The reason the Holy Spirit came, folks, was to comfort us and to empower us to share Christ reason the Holy Spirit came. A spirit-filled Christian 
You know, you want to know the sign, the real sign of a spirit-filled Christian? Is he will be consistently sharing Christ. That's the sign of a spirit-filled Christian. It, it, it's, it's not those gifts. It's the action. What are they doing? What mission are they accomplishing? It, it, it's the sharing of Jesus Christ. Endued. He said you'll be endued with power to have something put on you to be clothed with. And let me say, if we're going to do fulfill this mission that God has sent us to fulfill, to take the gospel to the lost world, then we've got to make sure that we spend time with Christ and that we are filled with His Holy Spirit so we can go out and do a supernatural work in a supernatural power. We cannot do it on our own. Then we see His ascension. In verses 50 through 53, He led them to Bethany. While they're walking there, this would be the one last time they're going to follow him. They had followed him everywhere. They had followed him to the temple. They had followed him to other towns, Galilee. They had followed him around helping people, followed him up on the mountain, followed him out into the boat. One last time they're going to be following him. And he spoke with them as he was carried up into heaven. Can you imagine this? Look in, in, in Acts, I'll read it for you, or you can turn to Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. <clears throat> and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. He's going, as he's talking to them, He's giving them their, their, his last words. Listen, fellas, I'm leaving you, and here's what I need you to do. I need you to go and tell others. He starts ascending into heaven. How many have ever been with a loved one when they were passing away and, and heard their final words? Hey, those are important words, aren't they? I mean, when they're looking at you, and maybe it's not their final words, but their final words to you, they say, look, I may not see you again. I want to tell you some things most likely they're going to tell you some things that are very dear to them because they know it's the last time we're going to see you so now Jesus here his last words he's going to utter these men on earth what are these important words go and tell they worship verse 52 <coughs> they were no longer afraid they were no longer lost in wonder. They rejoiced and they praised God. Let me tell you something, Christian. There, there's a lot of things, tough things in this world. But we of all people ought to be the, the most joyful people in the world because we have an eternity to look forward to. Let me ask you this question. What would happen if we made his last command our first priority. Think about that. Let that sink in. His last command, last words he's going to say to them, go and tell. What if we made his last command our first priority? I wonder. I wonder how that would change not just our church. I wonder how that would change Mount Olive. I wonder how that would change the place you work. I wonder how that would change uh, uh, the neighborhood. I wonder how that would change our schools. I wonder how that would change the state, our nation, if God's people would take Christ's last command and make it their first priority. Preacher, you schedule a time and, and we'll, we'll go tell people and we'll, we'll schedule a time. But it doesn't have to be a scheduled time. It ought to be everywhere. Everyone telling everyone on the ball fields, at the gas station, at the grocery store, at work, at school, everywhere, telling people about Christ. We live in a broken world. In a world where people are groping in darkness trying to find their way. We live in a dark world of pain and sorrow. And it is us, his followers, 
that he is commissioned to go into this dark world carrying the light of his gospel to seek the lost, to bring again that which was driven away, to bind up that which was broken, to strengthen that which is sick. It's us that he's commissioned to carry the light. Us, plural, all-inclusive, us as children. Matthew 5, 14, Jesus told his disciples, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. So this morning, church, I want to encourage you. We're going to leave these doors. We're going back out into a dark world. Shine. Go out and shine. Preacher, it's tough. He never said it would be easy. By the way, you're a man in here. Take that challenge. I like a challenge. You know, how many of you men uh, have that philosophy? You're not looking for a, a fight, but you're not going to run from it when it comes either. If it's something worth fighting. I mean, if somebody comes up and starts messing with my family, I'm not looking for that fight. But I'm telling you what, I, I'm not going to run for, from it. All right? Hey, I got me a Christmas present. I got to unlock it to open it. I'm not very fast with it, but. Hey, go out and shine. Preacher, there's going to be opposition. Yeah, go out and shine. Well, preacher, I, well, I think we can help society these ways. No, they need Christ first off. Preacher, let's go feed the hungry. Let's do go feed the hungry. We need to be feeding the hungry. But while we feed the hungry, we better tell them about Christ. Let's clothe the poor. Hey, I'm all for it. Let's clothe them. Let's uh, uh, give them coats in the winter. Man, we need to do that and blankets and, and all that's right. But while we do it, we need to be telling them about Christ. So go and tell. Christian, go and tell. Bow your head and close your eyes, please. Lord, I want to thank you that, that you love us you give us your word that we can stand upon and measure our life by and use to guide us Lord what an honor what a privilege to be able to be commissioned by you to go and tell a lost world now father we get so wrapped up in our lives that we forget that sometimes and this new year this 2017 would you help us to make your last command our first priority. Let's stand, please, at the piano plays, heads bowed, eyes closed. If you want to kneel in your seat, the Lord's